Hi, traders. How are you? How are you, traders? Welcome. Welcome. We are live. That's right. Welcome to another live Q&A session with Oliver Velez. Of course, my name is Oliver Velez. And don't forget, I am your trader for life. That's right. I hope all's been well. I've missed you. Uh, I haven't been able to do one of these live sessions in the last week or so, but um, we're back at it, guys. I'm shooting I'm shooting with you live from Sao Paulo in Brazil. I've been here for the past uh, week and a half or so, almost two weeks going on. I'll be leaving soon, but it's been a really phenomenal, phenomenal stop here on my uh, international freedom tour. I am traveling the globe, spreading the gospel of trading to whoever will listen. <laughs> All right, it's been interesting times in the market here, guys. I'm, I'm so glad that you are here. I'm so glad that uh, many of you show up here. Um, I'm interested in knowing where you're piping in from. I just told you where I'm coming in from. All right, but um, while I'm waiting for your comments, I will tell you that, um, as usual, I typically draw questions initially from my Twitter page. So if you're really, truly interested in getting the highest possibility of your question being answered because it's always virtually impossible for me to, to take every single question, um, uh, every single session. But you'll have slightly greater odds of me taking your question if you ask it on my Twitter page, guys. That is OLBELEZ007. That is my moniker virtually across all platforms, just so you know. All right. So anyway, um, boom. Boom. Tennessee is in the house. Tampa is in the house, I see. Fantastic. All right. Mexico is in the house. California is in the house. Uh, we typically draw an international audience here. Bra Brazil. Brazil's in the house. India. Fantastic, guys, from all over the world here. Atlanta, Georgia. We can't start anything without Atlanta. You know that. All right, guys. Fantastic. <laughs> Good. The Netherlands. Nigeria, Algeria, wow, all over, guys, all over. Fantastic. So let's get right down to it, guys. Um, drawing this question from drawing this question from David Williams, um, who's asked on my Twitter page, Oliver, um, YouTube question. Please comment on taking events like Elephant Bars. That's one of the events that I teach my traders to take and red bar ignored events green bar ignored events these are specific labels i've given to specific tradable events in the market so elephant bars red bar ignored events green bar ignored events um so this person uh david's asking um please comment on taking these events when price is trading in a range all right so First of all, I think it's probably best if I go to a chart, maybe. I think that might be best to demonstrate my, my response to this. Okay. So why don't I do that? All right. So if we take a look here, we're looking at a we're looking at a chart of Bitcoin here. It doesn't really matter what we look at, to be honest with you here. Um when we're talking about when we're talking about trading taking tradable events your best tradable events are always going to be when your stock is free to the left now it doesn't really matter what the event is it can be an elephant bar it can be an, a, a red bar ignored it can be a tail bar but one general guideline that I think will keep the majority of traders playing cleaner events is if they get in the habit of looking to the left. Let me give you an example of looking to the left. All right. So if we take, for instance, this elephant bar right there, that is a solid fat. We'll blow it up. Nice elephant bar. Now. If we take this bar 
and you look to the left, what do you find? Check this out. This bar, if we look to the left, there's nothing to the left of it. There is something to the bottom of it, but there is nothing to the left of it. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so it has clean, clean air. It has an op a wide open feel to move, okay? Now, if we take as an example, as another example, if we were to take this bar right there, now look to the left of that bar and you've got something to the left, which means that it's not free yet, okay? So the events that I like you to take, the better events will either have nothing to the left of them, all right? So here's an RBI, that's a red bar ignored. That has nothing to the left. Here's a nice elephant bar that has nothing to the left of it. It's free. And even on your short side, all right, when you're playing something on the short side, playing it to the downside, it's best if it has nothing to the left of it. For instance, like take a look at this solid bar here. Here's a solid elephant bar. Now look to the left. And for the most part, it has nothing to the left, or if it has something to the left, it's not very close. It's far away to the left, All right? Far away to the left, you can eventually get something, but we want the majority of our plays to have nothing to the left. That means that they are free. They are not encumbered by anything. There's nothing overhead on a long or underneath to obstruct the path to the downside, all right? And so when you're, you're talking about these events, I don't want you to predominantly take them in ranges. When you're playing an event in a range, it's always got something immediately to the left of it. Now, doesn't mean that you can't ever take something that has something to the left. I'm talking about the majority of your plays, so I hope that helps, guys, I hope that helps. Hope that helps our friend um, David Williams. Okay, next question, Alexander. Uh, hello, Master. Uh, I'm your follower. Fantastic. Is it true that due to the war in Ukraine, that many miners, I'm assuming this individual is talking about Bitcoin miners, will have to turn off their computers? At what price will they turn them off? Will they migrate to mine again? Will this negatively affect the transaction price in Bitcoin? Well, first of all, um, I want you to understand that Bitcoin is an anti-fragile network. It is very difficult to harm it. It is very difficult to hurt it. It's virtually impossible to stop it. Um, we saw how anti-fragile Bitcoin was when China last May, banned, banned Bitcoin mining in their entire country. At that particular time, 60% of Bitcoin's hash rate was coming from China. And China took approximately a 50% hit to the Bitcoin network hash rate. So it was a decline in the hash rate. And what you saw is that number one, most of those miners eventually migrated to Kazakhstan Many of them migrated as far as the United States. So states like Texas were the, were, uh, were the beneficiary of an influx of additional Bitcoin miners. Um, and what we eventually saw is that the network through its um, genius structure basically mended itself, all right? by adjusting what's called the difficulty rate. Now, this is an ingenious invention by Satoshi Nakamoto. The difficulty rate, what happens is that when there's less miners on the network, the difficulty rate lightens up, all right? Which basically means that the existing miners, right, become actually more profitable because the difficulty rate in solving the the puzzle or the equation to 
earn Bitcoin becomes easier, all right? Allowing the, and what this easier, what this easier difficulty rate does is it actually creates game theory. It brings more miners to the network because earning Bitcoin becomes easier. So miners get wiped out, difficulty rate drops, new miners come in with force, bringing the hash rate back to where it should be, and the difficulty rate rises again. And it's this ingenious structure of the Bitcoin network that gives it its, its ability to ebb and flow. It is truly one of the marvels of computer science, of technology. It's the only network that has virtually never been down over the past 10 years. In the past 10 years, it's never been down. There is no network in the world that has never been down. There is no network in the world other than Bitcoin that has never been hacked, all right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can't control it. You can't hurt it. You can't maim it. You can't hack it. You can't close it. You cannot shut it down. And this is what makes it scary for a lot of entities and governments who are obviously um, more prone to like things that they can control. All right, so for the first time in the history of the world, well, actually the second time in the history of the world, we have a form of money that cannot be controlled by an outside force. That first form of money we had was gold. Gold was not created by government. Gold was not created by a company. You could not control gold. It was made from God, it was made by God or the, the, you know, the natural elements of the universe. This was the first form of money that was not manufactured by anyone, all right? And therefore, to a certain extent, could not be controlled. But what happened is through confiscation and the hoarding of the vast majority of gold by governments, gold became centralized and therefore gold's greatest property was ruined by the total centralization of gold by the powers that be, all right? And this is something that you can't do with the new digital goal called Bitcoin, all right? Hope that helps, guys, all right? Uh, let's see here, what's next? What is next here? Okay, AJ says, uh, uh, good day, boss. How relevant, this is a good question, how relevant are the pre-market highs and lows when trading the open. All right, thank you very much. All right, so most of you are, are likely to be familiar with the fact that there is some pre-market trading that goes on before the opening bell in the American markets, right? This pre-open data, I believe that even Robinhood just extended their the, the ability for their clients to trade the pre-market open, I think as early as 7.30 a.m. Eastern time. I'm not sure, but I, I, I thought I saw some announcement to that effect. But anyway, there is pre-market data or pre-market trading, which creates pre-market data. This pre-market trading is typically very thin, um, there's not a great deal of, vol of, of volume that happens pre-market most of the time. I've always encouraged my traders to ignore the data. I don't want them using pre- and post-market data that will alter the true nature of their moving averages. So I want them always focused on the 20 period simple moving average and the 200 period simple moving average. If you start incorporating pre and post market data, you actually skew those moving averages and you, you, you throw them off of their true nature. Now think of it this way, an exchange reports at the end of the day for newspapers and, 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 and media outlets and what have you, it's official 
ending prices. You have the open, you have the close, you have the high of the day and the low of the day. None of those data points includes pre-market trading. So in pre-market trading, you can actually have a print that winds up being higher than the high of the normal hours. And the exchange will not include that higher print because it did not happen during normal hours. So if the exchange does not include it in its data, you should not be including it in your data. In addition to that, guys, when I was trading on Wall Street, I picked off traders in pre-open trading, making mistakes all the time. In fact, at one particular point, it was a healthy portion of my morning profitability that before the market opened, I would pick off traders making mistakes in pre-open trading, placing a wrong order in and picking them off. This was before trades could be broken. Their bro trades are broken a lot of times when they're way off the price. But back in those days, trades were not broken as easily as they are today. So I'd catch a trader mistakenly leaving a one off of a off of a $15 stock. So instead of placing an order for $15, he forgot the one or the one didn't register. He placed the order for $5 and I'd pick him off at $5. You understand? And it was basically nothing the trader could do about it, but go file a uh, a, a formal complaint that would take months to resolve and most people didn't do that all right so i i just think i encourage most traders to stay away from playing pre-market there's a lot of games by bigger players that can be accomplished or played in the pre-market period that can't be done during normal market hours and in fact to take this even further my traders will tell you that I don't want them trading the first minute of the first day. In fact, the vast majority of times, I don't want them trading the first two minutes. So if I don't want you trading the first one or two minutes of normal hours, I certainly don't want you trading before the first minute or two minutes of the trading day. There's a lot of games that can be played in pre-market trading there's also those games can spill over into that first minute or two of the market, and then the games dramatically decline. The ability to play games drops significantly after the first two minutes of the trading day. All right. And I think that's very important to understand. All right. The ability to play these games with traders is the highest during pre-market trading. It gets lower when the market opens and they pretty much disappear after two minutes of trading. All right, so I hope that that, that makes sense there. All right, let's do, let's take the next one here. All right. All right, psychology question from Estella. Hi, Oliver, I'm very thankful for what I'm learning. Awesome, I would like to ask, if you can share with us what crossed your mind when you were in your worst moment, uh, when you said, I suck, <laughs> but still knew that there, that this was for you and you, and you, you, you would keep coming back. Um, talking about what, what this person is asking me about what I remember about that time. So yes, guys, um, it took, it took, approximately six years of true hardship for me to um, really turn the corner in my trading. Now, remember, guys, back in the early 1980s, when I started, there were no mentors. There were no books, really. There were no seminars to go to. Um, there were no classes of any kind. It was an entire it was a world where you either got hired by a trading organization on Wall Street or you tried it on your own with your own capital um, 
you opened up an account. There was no such thing as a demo or a simulator or a way to practice because you placed your orders by phone. You couldn't pick up a phone and get the broker on the other line and say, um, yes, buy 1,000 shares of Intel, but wait a minute, don't buy 1,000 shares of Intel, boom. Like you couldn't practice that way. <laughs> you could practice on paper, but it was entirely trial and error. And the way I learned was I put a little stake together, opened an account, and I took a list of things to try. And when I lost every single thing on item one, when I lost my whole account on item one, let's say I have a list of 10 things I wanted to try to see if they worked. I knew to cross something off of my list when I lost my whole account on that item. So I would lose my entire account trying item number one and I cross item number one off. I'd go to work part time, grab an, a, a decent amount again to open up another account and try item number two. When, when I lost my entire account on item number two, repeat, go to work part time. Um, I worked for a, I worked for a temp agency down in the wall street area in New York city. And they would give me temporary jobs based on the criteria that I wanted them. I wanted no longer than six weeks, but preferably four weeks. I did not want to leave my trading more than a month, really. And I would take that paycheck, take a portion to live with, put the other portion in a trading account and go to item number three. And this is how, this is what I did for roughly six years trying to turn the corner. And there were some very dark periods because there are times when instead of paying my rent, I would take the rent money and put it in my trading account. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell you some things that kept me going during the dark periods, during the depression days. There were days where I was so down because and so fearful that I was going to prove everyone who doubted me right. I was going to prove my parents right. I was going to prove my friends who said I was crazy for doing this right. A big portion of my motivation was preventing myself from proving all the naysayers right. But what kept me alive a lot of times was imagining projecting myself in the future and, the, and imagining one day that I'd be using my dark days, I'd be using my depression, I'd be using my hardship as a way to motivate other people. I did this in the depths of my depression that I would, I would stop myself and say, Oliver, one day you will be telling stories about you being depressed. One day, people will hang on your every word to know how you made it. One day, people will ask questions about what kept you alive, and here we are. And so I would stop myself from crying. I would stop myself in my tracks and say, all right, enough of this, all right? This, I'm gonna use this one day. And I used my imagination that way. I projected myself in the future and said, one day I am going to use this period for the benefit of others. And that little mind trick, that little hack, for lack of a better word, um, was something that I, I applied on myself very, very frequently. And it worked. It really worked. What made my journey so much more difficult as well is the fact that there was no one really to talk to. It wasn't like I had like-minded individuals that I could go to. There was no groups. I didn't know anyone else who wanted to be a trader. So I couldn't share anything. No one could relate to me being stopped out frequently. <laughs> 
or losing my money. Everyone thought it was just a casino and that I was ruining my life. My parents thought I was ruining my education. They spent zillions of dollars to send me to the best schools in the United States. And uh, they're like, what are you doing gambling, Oliver? You're sick. But um, here I am, still sick. <laughs> All right. All right. What else here, guys? What else have we got? All right. Sometimes I will say this to you guys. Sometimes your biggest foe, your most outspoken critic, is the person you lie down with every single night. Sometimes the very people that want you to fail at this are the people you dine with, that you break bread with in your home every single night. That makes this journey so much more difficult when there is that lack of support and you live with that lack of support. And the best thing I can say is that if that is your scenario, you must do your best to remain silent, that you grow in silence, that you progress in silence. You want to stop this habit of people asking you every single day. So how did the trading go? Do not allow that. All right. Do not allow that. Don't allow outsiders into your process all right this will only slow you down do you understand what i'm saying tell me you understand what i'm saying i want to see your comments all right your process must be protected your process must be like a little embryo nature has it that when we're born or when we're conceived we are kept secret from the world for nine months, more or less. We're not given exposure because we're not strong enough to meet the, we're not strong enough to meet the, the challenges of certain things in the world when we're first conceived. When your process is in the process, is it at the point of being conceived when you're in that developmental phase, you're very sensitive. It's very fragile. And you don't want anyone to touch that. You don't want anyone invading that process. You remain silent. You keep this thing precious until it gets strong enough where you can let other people see it, poke it, touch it, and it can withstand some negativity. In the beginning, it can't even stand negativity. So don't allow people in your process. If you're, if someone in your household is asking you every single day, how's your trading? All right, stop it. Just tell them, listen, you know what? Um, we're going to stop this. All right. I will occasionally update you, but I just need this process to be mine right now. Please respect that. And I'm telling you, it'll be better. It'll be better. All right. Mm. Mark Edwards is asking, Oliver, if you submit your limit order close to the 20 period moving average, but that value would violate your 50% rule, should you not trade close to the 20, 20 period moving average there? Ah, interesting question. So I think that, let me go to some charts here. I think that what this trader is asking is this. I'll draw on this chart, okay? Let me draw on this chart. So I think what this trader is asking is, Oliver, here my stock has moved up, right? And here is the 20 period moving average down here. 
So that's the 20 period moving average. And the stock pulls back to the 20 period moving average. But that point of at the 20 period moving average is actually below the 50% mark. No, I think I did that wrong. <laughs> Let's do it again. So, and then your 20 period moving average is here. Let's say, and the pullback to the 20 is past the 50% level. It's hard to draw with this thing. <clears throat> Should you take the trade off of the 20 period moving average? This is a, going to be a lower a lower odds play because the drop is so deep, all right? Now, think of this as being a wall that this, now the stock has to climb this tall wall to make new highs, but it's greater odds of the attempt failing, all right? The walls that you want to climb are you want them to be smaller, like this. Now, from there, the wall to climb is not that great. But from here, the wall to climb is great. And therefore, the odds of climbing all the way to the top of a tall wall is lower than the odds of climbing to the top of a small wall. All right? So we want our walls to be small, not great like this, all right? That's a big wall to overcome, and this is a small wall to overcome, all right? So if, you're, if, you're, if your stock is even pulling back to the 20, what this means is that this run up was so big that the drop even back to the 20 period moving average is a steep drop because it's coming from such a big high, a tall high, and declines from super far tops typically fail. The secondary attempt typically fails because the fall is so great. So think of it this way. If you were to stand at the top of a building. Let's say that's the top of the building. Let's say this building is 40 floors, 40 floors. Now, you're at the top of this building and you throw a ball down the building to hit the pavement. That ball hits the pavement down here. Boom. That ball odds of coming all the way back to the 40th floor is very small. Maybe the 10th floor, maybe the 15th floor, boom, and fall back to the ground, right? Why? Because the ball fell from the 40th floor. The, the drop was too great to overcome on the bounce off of the pavement. However, what if this is the second floor? Now you throw the ball down. You have higher odds of the bounce even going higher than the second floor. So the point is, is that the bigger the drop, all right, the bigger the drop, the greater the odds that the next attempt fails. The more controlled the odds are higher that you get a successful attempt. But here, now you fail. I hope that makes sense. So if you're coming down, if you're falling from a great height and reaching the 20 period moving average below the 50% point, that means your drop is huge. And that bounce 
is likely going to be short-lived and fail. It's what I call the dead cat bounce, all right? Dead cat bounce. Um, you drop, I love cats, guys, so don't take this literally, but the dead cat bounce theory is this. If you drop a cat from the top of a tall building, the cat hits the pavement and is instantly dead. The body of the dead cat might bounce, but that doesn't mean that the cat is alive. The body bounces off the pavement, and then the body falls back to the pavement. That's a dead cat bounce. I love cats, guys. Don't take it. Don't take it literally, please. All right. Um, but if you drop, boom, a cat, and that cat comes way past the fifty percent mark. That cat's alive, and you better run because it's not happy. <laughs> it's coming to get you, all right? So dead cat bounce, usually halfway, and failure, all right? There's the smack to the pavement. There's the dead, the, the dead carcass bouncing, but it's dead. It's going to fall back. All right. So be careful of buying sharp, big declines. You want your declines to be more controllable, like almost like a, gl a hang glider gliding off of a mountaintop. You don't want a fall. You want a glide. Boom. All right. There's a very big difference. There's an art in knowing what pullbacks to buy into, the glides you buy into, the very controllable ones. Look at this, look at this glide, look at this, very controllable. It's not a collapse like that, all right? When you get the collapse, it's usually the second dairy attempt that has the higher odds like this. So you get this drop and that one, has the better odds. This one fails, and this one has the better odds of going, all right? So if you even take a look at Bitcoin here, here we drop, we drop hard here. This is a hard drop here, boom. But failed attempt, the second one goes, the second one on your sharps, boom, that second one is your play. This one is a trap most of the time, all right? I hope that helps there, guys. I hope that helps. Let's see, what else? What else? Uh, Mark Edwards is asking, would that help identify this back here, guys. Would that help identify? A sell point when the distance to the 20 is way above the 50% value. Yeah. So when you are when you are far away from your 20. So let's say here's your 20 period moving average, and here is your, your stock is far away from the 20. Can this be, I'm always teaching my traders, when you separate away from that 20, that's a profit taking surge away from the 20 when you accelerate away from the 20. But can you go the other way? It depends, not always. It depends largely on the maturity of this move. So where did the move start from? Is there time and space? We have space away from the 20 period moving average, but do you have time? So for instance, if your if your stock moves starts here and then goes there, maybe that's not a good short, even though it's far away from the 20, 
because you don't have time. See? There's the best shorts against the trend have both time duration in the trend and space. So it looks like this, guys. Take a look at this. You've got time duration in the tr in the trend and you have space right so your stock has been going for a while and then surges right so now you've got time in the trend it's not early in the trend it's kind of late in the trend and you now have space away from your key moving average. When your time and your space are roughly equal, they don't have to be exactly equal. So when this arrow is relatively equal to this arrow, it's time. Your time in picking a moment to go the other way is better than over here with very little time. I hope that didn't confuse most of you, but um, I teach my traders this time and space concept for timing some really amazing trades with that concept. All right. All right, guys. All right. Uh, Nicole Smith is saying Oliver prefers the two minute time frame because it gives you more trading opportunities than the five or the 15. That is true. Now, let me speak to time again, because this is I get this every single time, by the way, I get this all the time, guys. So look. There are four dominant time frames, four dominant ones that I teach my traders to four windows, two minute, five minute, 15 minute, and daily time frame. all right? They're not the only four time frames, but they're the four dominant ones that my traders look at. So two minute, five minute, 15 minute, and the daily chart, all right? The daily chart and the 15 minute are used as advisors they advise you on the odds of your play having flow, okay? I'm not gonna go into the details, but they're advisors. They don't pick the play. The 15 minute and the daily do not pick your play. Your two minute or your five minute, these two time frames are your trade pickers. They pick the play. These advise on the play. They never pick, all right? Now, do you choose a two minute to pick or the five minute to pick? That is your personal choice. My traders during their developmental period, they're gonna use the two minute chart because the two minute chart gives them, as Nicole mentioned, gives them more trading opportunities. And remember that you can't learn how to do this unless you're inside of trades all the time. Like, you can't learn how to do this listening to me. It helps, but it's not progress. You can't learn how to do this reading a book. It helps, but it's not progress. You can't learn this in a seminar. It helps, but it's not progress. Progress can only occur inside of real trades. Do you understand? The moment you enter a trade, tick, 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 tick tick, tick, your progress clock is ticking. The moment you end the trade, there is no ticking. You can read until you go blind. You can study charts until your eyes go bad. All right? You're not making progress. That clock doesn't start ticking until you enter the next trade. Now, you're quite obviously, you're going to find more trading opportunities on a two-minute chart than on a five minute chart. So if the first goal is to become as experienced, if the first goal is to get 10,000 trades under your belt, don't you wanna do that faster than slower? This is why traders 
traders have something going against them right from the start and it is their desire to make money first this is a problem but of course we all understand that the whole objective of trading is to make money but it can't be the objective first the first objective must be to become experienced it's a big difference because this experience requires loss. You can't become experienced just winning. You must have wins. You must have experience getting destroyed. You must have experience losing. In fact, you have to have more experience losing than winning. You have to put losing behind you do you understand? You have to go through loss. You have to become intimate with every possible mistake a human being can make so that it gets behind you. I don't know how to say that better, but what I'm saying is this desire to be profitable right from the start is what contributes to the high failure rate in trading because it is impossible. Your success is on the other side of experience and experience must be both winning and losing, but mostly losing. If someone told me this when I was struggling, maybe I wouldn't have been so depressed. Maybe my hardship wouldn't have, that cross that I had to bear wouldn't have been so heavy. If someone told me that I was supposed to lose, that this is how you rise, you must squat before you leap. You must go backwards before you jump forward. I didn't know that. I didn't know that every single loss was moving me closer to being the master trader that I wanted that I was becoming so intimate with every mistake that actually naturally they just started to fall away. That I stopped being afraid of losing because I lost so much, that it lost its grip on me, that it stopped scaring me, it stopped spooking me, it stopped, make, it stopped making me depressed because I've been there, done this so many times, I'm tired of being depressed about it anymore. I went through the loss. I wish more traders understood that you're supposed to lose in the beginning. Just like a baby is supposed to fall in the beginning while learning how to walk. It's impossible not to. You can't be good before you become experienced. And you can't become experienced unless you have gone through thousands upon thousands of losing trades. And this is, this is one of the main reasons, guys, why I created my program. My program is designed, right, to prevent, to to give you the ability to build that precious experience without ruining your family, without ruining your financial life. It allows you to lose without losing. It allows you to build yourself through this experience building process without destroying your finances. I had to destroy my finances, but you don't today. And that's what the program was designed to do, guys. Speaking of which, guys, I don't know if you're going to be in town, but I'd love to have you join me in Medellin, Colombia. All right, guys, I have a, a lot of people don't don't realize this, but I have a trading. I have a trading kids program. Uh, we have uh, 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 more than 500 kids have gone through my trading kids program. Um, their ages range anywhere from between 10 and 16. 
years of age. And um, this event is special because it's the first time, Medellin, Colombia, the first time I am having dual events with the parents and their kids. This is powerful. You got to start them off young, right? Kids get this, guys. Kids get this like a video game. They trade better than their parents. They're more profitable than their parents and from an early age. Can you imagine if a kid took this up at 10 years old, like it was homework, all right? Do you imagine where they'd be by the time they're 21 years old? Totally independent, self-sufficient, maybe even wealthy. It's crazy. That's 11 years of experience, right? It took me six years to turn the corner. That's 11 years. Start these kids off young with this. They get it. It's like a video game, all right? Start them young. That's what we do with my, my, my Trading Kids program, all right? So you and your child will learn how to trade, all right? You'll be in different departments of the event, but we're doing it as a family here. Medellin, June 4th, 5th, and 6th. Try to be there if you can, all right? All right, especially if you're in, in, the, in Colombia. All right, powerful, powerful, changing the world, one trader and one kid at a time. I love it. <laughs> all right. Else says, I was thinking about the kids program for your nephew. Start them young. Start them young before that adult mind takes over. <laughs> Guys, there was a, I got to I'm going to show you what the adult mind can do, right? Versus the kid mind. You, you know, um, you've got to maintain this childlike mind to really stay correct in your trading because the adult mind can overly complicate things and this game is really quite simple so someone sent me this right i'm going to show you what i'm going to show you an example of the adult mind right all right let's see here let me see if i can find it this was a comment on youtube here right? so here's the adult mind at work guys check this out uh oliver uh to, and, and if this person's listening right now i'm i'm please don't take offense at this you do have the adult mind. We can fix this. But this is, an, this is an example of the adult mind. Oliver, to be clear, can you define exactly what you mean by solid bars? So obviously I say, I want you to look for solid bars, you know, solid, fat, green bars, right? That's what, so Oliver, can you be exact? Let's be clear. Define exactly what you mean by solid. Where does the solid begin and end in your view? <laughs> How solid are we talking? Are we talking a little solid? Are we talking a medium solid? Are we talking a big solid? How solid is solid in regards to price only or price plus solid volume? Does volume make it more solid? This is the adult mind at work, right? So when I tell when I tell my kids, my 12-year-olds, right? My 12-year-old kids in the program, I tell them, look, I need you to uh I need you to look at this chart and pull out there's eight fat solid green bars. Find all eight of them. And you know what? Not a single one of them says, but Oliver, what do you mean by solid? How solid? How tall? How fat? Can you give me a number? Can you give me a ratio? Is there a ruler? Is there a tool you can sell me to measure the solidness of a solid bar? Like that's adult mindset over complicating things. You know what the kids do? That's one. That's a fat one. That's a fat one. That's a fat one. And that's a fat one. Boom, just like that. They don't overcomplicate things like adults do. And sometimes we have to, 
What's the Christian saying? You know, we have to become reborn again. We have to become a child again to get things right, to not overcomplicate this simple game. Guys, this game is a game of twos, right? You've got two, two directions up and down. You've got two transactions, buy and sell. You've got two results, win and loss. My traders have two moving averages, the 20, the 200. You've got two states, narrow and wide. You've got two locations above the moving averages or below the moving averages. It's a game of freaking twos. I tell traders all the time, stop overcomplicating this thing. If you can count to two, you can do this. But if you start to count beyond two, three, four, five, six, you're overcomplicating the game and you're making this a lot more difficult than it needs to be. All right? It's a simple game. We have to stay simple. All right? All right. Um, what could be Mihar? This I'm gonna have to end on this question here, guys. Um, Mihar is asking, what could be the top five trading rules for an intermediate trader? I don't know what an intermediate trader is, but I can throw out some rules. Maybe there's not gonna be five, but let me end this session with things that I think are amazing guidelines for trading and will tend to keep most traders out of trouble. Rule number one, okay? Play your trades, the vast majority of your trades should be in the same direction as the 20 period moving average. You understand? So if the 20 period moving average is rising in your stock, on your stock, you should be looking for buys, not shorts. If your 20 period moving average is declining, you should be looking for shorts, not buys. Okay? Trade with the 20 period moving average, not against it. Rule number one. Trade with the 20 period moving average, not against it. This will eliminate 85% of the problems out there in trading. 85% gone with that rule number one. Rule number two, play the dominant color. Play the dominant color. Look at your chart, which color, red or green, <coughs> excuse me guys, which color is producing the strongest bars on average and the greatest number of, their, of its own color. So it's a simple, it's a simple glance. Are there more green bars on your chart than red bars? And are there more fat green bars than fat red bars? That's the dominant color, green, play green, all right? Play green. So rule number one, play in the direction of the 20 per moving average. Play with the 20, not against it. Rule number two, play the dominant color. If the dominant color is green, you're looking for buys. If the dominant color is red, you're looking for shorts, sells. Okay? Rule number two. Rule number three. Pick entry points at or near the 20 period moving average. Not away. All right? So you should be looking to get into the stock somewhere around. It doesn't have to be touching but not so far away from the, the stock's 20 period moving average. So if we put those three things together, trade with the 20 period moving average. So let's say you got a rising 20, now you're looking for buys, okay? That stock during its trending upward is painting more green bars than red. Good, you're playing the right color. You're looking for movements back toward the 20 period moving average, right? For your entries, you want to enter near that 20 period moving average, not far away from it. All right. Rule number four. 
before. Look to the left. Demand that your play, most of your plays, have clear air to the left. Far away, you can have obstruction, but not close. You do these four things. I promise you, the quality of your trades are going to go through the roof. All right. And you're going to be eliminating some of the biggest faults and errors that's responsible for the vast majority of traders' losses. All right. Four rules to abide by. All right, traders. I love you to death. Thank you very much once again for joining me, guys. I wish I could take a lot more of your questions, um, but we, we'll keep doing this. I love that you keep showing up. I love the quality of a lot of your questions. Uh, keep them coming. Guys, join me um, on my Twitter page because, again, I'm going to be drawing from my the questions asked on Twitter more frequently than anywhere else. Okay? So Twitter, OLVelez007. Join me over there, and I will see you, boom, the next time. Ciao for now. Love you to death. Love you guys. Love you. Yeah. Another one. Ooh. Ciao.